Mr. Harshwardhan Jyotia, Mr. Pankaj Patel, Mr. Rashid Shah, Mr. Didar Singh, distinguished members of the FIKI. It's always a pleasure to be at the annual session of the FIKI, where leaders of Indian industry put their heads together and discuss where the industry stands and where the country stands. The last year has been an unusual one where the outgoing president of the FIKI, while discussing the state of economy, always uh, interrupted it with his pre preference for literature. <laughs> and therefore, all the miles that he traveled with me, it was always a delightful departure to freshen oneself with various uh, anecdotes and quotations from history and literature, which were always a part of his speech. But this year has been a very unusual one. Unusual for the world and unusual for India. Unusual for the world for the simple reason that uh, The world doesn't know in which direction it's moving. It's certainly a slower direction. People are relying on uh, unconventional solutions. There is a growing uh, protectionism. There's also a growing cynicism. So if we look at uh, the various trends we've seen globally in this year, the Brexit vote surprised many people. Most people felt that uh, eventually one of the world's most mature democracies will not vote the way it did. But then inequalities, benefits cornered by a few, the desire to take their own decisions, all this impacted the vote. The US presidential election also saw a lot of cynicism in the vote. Finally, the party and the which won, or whose candidate won, was traditionally regarded as a trade-friendly party. The Republicans were always more trade-friendly than the Democrats. And the Global situation as also the U.S. situation had pushed them into taking an excessively protectionist position. Cynicism was taken at its peak where uh, in Latin America, Colombia, by a referendum rejected the peace treaty, that we don't want peace. Now, this is a very unusual vote for a country uh, and a position to adopt. The recent Italian referendum and the anticipated vote in certain larger European nations all make the global situation very unpredictable. It's certainly slower. And the world economy, therefore, is going to move slower than it was in the earlier years. And it's therefore necessary for various countries 
to actually determine their own cost themselves because the global trends are not particularly helpful. Amongst emerging economies, if we look at India, I think it's a, it's a refreshing change from what's happening in the rest of the world. Three years ago, an economy which was being regarded as a part of the fragile five, today unquestionably is regarded as one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing major economy in the world. And if we look at the last one year in India, and I'm referring only to last year because this is your annual meeting, it's always good to reflect on the recent events of the year. I think we've had a series of very important changes. The first which has been advocated for a very long time, but never really could be implemented, that instead of one person, you now have a monetary policy committee. So a far more broad-based body with a statutory backing, which now decides uh, various decisions relevant to the monetary policy. A big departure from the past. We for decades spoken in terms of rationalizing subsidies and therefore giving it the statutory support under the Aadhaar legislation which was passed earlier this year, we now find that in various areas, we are being able to check leakages, we are being able to target subsidies in the direction in which they were meant. And this has indeed helped us uh, to change even the course of discussion. If you recollect the 2014 elections, what was the content of the discussion? Whether it should be nine subsidized cylinders for everyone including the wealthy or it should be 12. That was the thought process. And suddenly you have only the more deserving who are entitled to it, the very poor are entitled to more subsidized if not free in the first instance, and those who can afford it will give it up. And therefore, in a true sense, this rationalization of subsidies, whether it's petroleum products or it's uh, gas, and then pilot projects with regard to fertilizer, food. In all these areas, we made a significant beginning and it's led to a large amount of savings. The passage of the insolvency and the bankruptcy law and the establishment of the institutions necessary for enforcing it, I think was another important development of this year. By far, one of the most important developments was the passage of the Constitution Amendment for the Goods and Services Tax. I'll refer to the present position just a moment later. And then, of course, the government took uh, a somewhat courageous step in the direction of uh, the high denominational currency ceasing to be a legally valid tender and went in for a large currency swap or an exchange. Now the fact that uh, 
India today has the capacity to take these decisions and a capacity to enforce these decisions, to experiment boldly, even when at the time when the world is looking more inwards. I think marks an exception as far as India is concerned. Having passed the constitution amendment, there are several decisions which the GST council now has to take and these are of very vital interest to India's industry. There are about 10 important decisions which have already been taken all unanimously by consensus. The legislations which have to be passed by parliament under the constitution amendment and the state legislatures are currently in the process of being drafted. I don't see any major difficulty in those legislations uh, being finally approved. There is only one issue which in the larger frame of things uh, is really a very small issue. Because when three major taxes and some minor taxes are all merged into one, the VAT, the excise, the service tax, and a number host of state taxes, then each assessee is going to be assessed only once. So you have already a pre-existing machinery at the center, you have a pre-existing machinery in the states, how is the burden of uh, this assessment going to be shared between the center and the states? How do we cross empower both the agencies of the center and the state when both these parallel uh, setups exist? Though ideally with a common taxation, it has to lead to a federal bureaucracy. But till such time it takes place because it's still a far cry, how does this sharing take place? There are certain kind of turf issues involved in that. We are trying to resolve it. But the constitutional embargo is very clear. The entire amendment was notified on the 16th of September 2016. And it permits uh, the old taxation regime to continue for a period of one year. So on the 16th of September 2017, as far as the current uh, mode of taxation is concerned, the curtains will be down. And therefore, neither the center nor the state can go in for collection under the current scheme. Ideally, it should be proper for the issues to be resolved. And at the beginning of the financial year, on the 1st of April, the new regime to take over. But then in any case, nobody has the luxury of time. It's a transactional tax, it's not an income tax, and a transactional tax can start at any part of the year. And therefore, the range of timing when it has to come into force because of a constitutional necessity is from the 1st of April to the 16th of September next year. Hopefully, the earlier we do it, the better it is for us to switch over to a new system itself. As far as the decision with regard to the currency is concerned, I think it marks a very important beginning. My first response uh, in a public engagement after this was that this decision Besides several other implications, once the remonetization process is complete and it has made a substantial headway, marks the creation of a new Indian normal. Because the normal that existed for 70 years is an unacceptable normal. The 70 year normal for almost everyone which had become a way of life in India, was not merely the fact that you had a lot more cash currency, far larger cash currency as a part of your GDP, 
the economic and social consequences of that are extremely adverse. And therefore, dealing in that cash currency had led to a lot of aberrations. Aberration in terms of tax non-compliance, in terms of uh, currency being used for collateral purposes, including crime, escaping the tax net, not getting into the banking system. And I think one of the efforts of this whole exercise has to be that even though a reduced cash currency would remain, and conscious effort will have to be made in order to supplement the rest with the digital currency. And the manner it has taken place in the last five weeks is indeed commendable. Only the parliament seems, or a section of parliament seems to be unaware of what's happening. I compared it the other day with the fact that if in the year 2000 uh, somebody had suggested that uh, every poor man in India will have a mobile phone, people would have laughed at him. But then that became a reality in a matter of a few years. And therefore, the same principle is applying that today you have almost more than 75 uh, crore credit and debit cards already in the market. You have different kinds of mobile applications and e-wallets already being experimented. You have uh, increases in terms of hundreds and thousands of percentage in the use of each one of the digital modes which is available. And this transformation now will have to be carried to its logical conclusion. The whole process of uh, remonetization is not going to take very long time. And I'm sure uh, 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 very soon the Reserve Bank by injecting currency daily through the banking and the postal system will be able to complete it. There are of course uh, even as we've reformed and we were looking at the global trends, there are also domestic trends which have been visible. And one of the conclusions that I have learned is to take these trends, to take these steps, one needs to have clarity of direction, courage, broad shoulders, and even the stamina to sustain these decisions. Because the level of stamina required to sustain these decisions in several sections of the society at times is lacking. And therefore, once we have this stamina, notwithstanding fringe positions taken even by national parties, one will always be able to implement these and implement this extremely successfully. The long-term benefits of this are going to be absolutely clear, even if we bear the short-term pain of some of these decisions. I think uh, Mr. Harshwardhan Neotia's uh, tenure has been an eventful year, and I'm sure uh, the long-term benefits his two successors who are here on stage will be witnesses to enjoy the benefits out of them. Thank you very much and wish you all the very best.